get. Great, it's joy. It's great. It's great to be joined by all of our welcome. It's great to be joined here for Kwama Gunga Four by um, our young entrepreneurs, Bonville uh, Wilson. You can wave to us, Wilson. You can wave and say hi. Hi, hi, hi to everyone. Uh, greetings from Rwanda. Uh, in the evening, we say in Kenya Rwanda, "Ngiriwe." Yes, in the morning, we greet Ngaramutse. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, please. Nice um, to meet you. Nice to meet you. And we're here with Christelle. Uh, hi, hi, I'm Christelle. Hello, uh, everyone. Excited to be here today. It's a very good day. Um, Bonfield, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Daru. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you, or good to hear you. Um, Pasafik, good to see you. Good to hear you. I hope it is. Good afternoon. Great. And yes, oh, we, we, have a, we have a member of the chamber board as well. Um, uh, somebody I admire a lot for the work he puts into building his brand. Regis, good afternoon to you. Regis, good afternoon to you. I'm going to have to mute you at the moment. Okay. So, Deborah, do you want to say a few words? Um, not really. Um, but 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 since you put me on the spot, um, <laughs> um, as you know, we each week we have been developing um yourselves as entrepreneurs, and we're really quite excited to really see how you've all been growing. Um, we recognise that um, you're still getting used to this interesting way of, of collaboration. So you can see that our style is not just chalk and talk. We really want you to be asking questions. We want you to be asking the most important questions to that that are within your minds so for example if you remember last week um fidel um I, I thought it was incredible the way that he talked about the um the uh supply chain issues um that he's addressing and these are real world issues and he's making a difference and that's what i want you to keep in your minds focusing on real world issues we are bringing together amazing support amazing experts but ultimately you are the experts that we want to be empowering so we want you to be bringing the most complicated questions that you have the questions that are sitting in your heart please ask them because as educators myself Daryl, Natida, we know that when you ask the questions that matter the most to you, then you will start to um, see a difference. So please don't just be lovely to our guests, even though they are lovely. Please ask the business questions that you have. Please ask um, ish, uh, things which, which you need solving. Then we really are transforming and and that's really what um my wishes for you my intention um and and as well as the team here we are we are your guides and we will always guide you to look at the the thing that you know needs to be asked but you might be avoiding it we're like no go and ask the question that you need to um ask so that's that's really my um my welcome my opening um, to this let's make this work for you you are leaders people absolutely love what you do you know that but as leaders you know now you've got to answer the real hard questions and um, that's what we want the focus to be so that's 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 my that's me setting out on um, the table okay so I hope you're happy with that and um, let's go Daryl I'm, I'm passing it over to you now Thank you. Any questions, guys? Any questions about today? Any questions about anything? Any questions?
Okay, so last week we were looking at the, we had a great session with Vincent looking at value mapping and value chains. I know some of you have done some work on that during the week. So um, is there anybody who would like to share their, their value chains with us? Christelle, I know you've done some work on your value chain. Yeah, I did. Would you like to, would, should we, would you like us to have a look at your value chain? Would you like to talk us, talk us through it? Would you like to do that? If I can bring it up. Yeah, I would like. Okay, let me okay. try and find it. So um, let me go onto my screen and find your. If we did this, here we are. So it's up on my screen now, and I will soon be sharing it with you. So can you see it now, everybody? Mm, yeah, I can see it. So let's just remind us what we were trying to do last week, building it from your, you know, that six word proposition to try and really articulate what your story is and start to articulate the story. We then moved on for you guys to then think about life from the customer's point of view in images, the struggle and pain they're facing, the products and services that you are delivering, and therefore the happy ever after. Um, and then we asked you to also think to, last week in terms of pictures, in terms of starting to map out the value system for your, for your business, for your enterprise. Um, again, using images. So Christelle, would you like to talk us through what you've created here? Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I tried to express uh, the whole chain of, 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 of activities from uh, like I do crocheting and knitting, so we basically work from yarn. Mm -hmm. Hello. Knitting yarn, so I sh uh, and uh, I work with disadvantaged disadvantaged women, mostly teenage mothers, to produce my knitwear, the knitwear that I sell. So I go to local authorities. Uh, uh, in the neighborhood we work from and they give me a list i train them i look from for, for some talented ones in craft then i use them to produce my knitwear so after the whole process of recruitment and production uh, we sell our knitwear then uh, we market it uh, the happily ever after is that clients feel comfortable in them and can wear them and we can give a better and healthy living to the women that uh, produce them. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And so well expressed. Does anybody want to add something there? What do you think, Bonfield, about the way in which um, Christelle has articulated her started to articulate her value chain and her story. Yeah, thank you, Daru. Uh, it, it's amazing, it's amazing. Uh, for the first time, I was really struggling even to understand what I have to do or what I need to do. Uh, and now really I can see uh, those images and I can understand easily the process of all the value chain from uh, zero to the final point. Easily without what? Hmm. Nicely done. Nicely done indeed. Yeah. So, so we've got for you. You've got you've got your materials, haven't we? On the left hand side, Christel, you've got your sheep, <laughs> the wool. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> it was hard to find a sheep which doesn't look. In <laughs> Great, and you've got your farm. You've got there's the sheep. The sheep, I can't even know what they're called. The sheep shearer, that's what they're called. They are shearing the sheep to shed yeah. them of their wool, yeah? But it would be interesting, wouldn't it, to look at, well, what farms, where are you it's getting your... Most of the sheep were... Huh? And where do, and, but you were talking about you, the fact that you used artificial wool because you can't get natural wool, is that right? Yeah, for now. Yeah. Yeah. But it is your your desire to find natural uh, wool. natural wool yeah that's yeah. the end goal yeah yeah uh, it's cheaper to find uh, synthetic wool now 
Okay, so I've, I have a question, and I'm sure others might I, I invite others in a minute. But in terms of your wall, therefore, would you see that you could create different ranges, some of which are at the uh, priced accordingly, depending on whether they are um, synthetic wool or whether they are indeed more natural wool? Uh, can you repeat that again? So if you're using natural wool, it's going to be a more expensive production process. Yeah, 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 exactly. So whether you could then start to differentiate your products to people who want just an everyday product using your, um, an artificial wool through to those that actually would like a garment that's made from, from real wool. Uh, yeah, I, I think I can have both, uh, like both lines. Yeah. Uh, like in the near future. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking towards that. But sure. now it's even uh, more difficult with the travels banned. I can't really travel. Uh, so, uh, but yeah. soon, yes. But as, as, as Vince said last week, you're going to start to see that the supply chains, whether they start from real wool or whether they start from artificial wool, they start from different points. They start from a different point. One is coming from a different point of manufacture, possibly um, of raw material to another. So as Vince was saying last week, you could see that sometimes you, as you develop your value chains, you could stem off into different, different areas because you're reaching different, maybe different markets of the future. Yeah. Deborah, do you, can you can you jump in and say something? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Christelle, I, I absolutely love um, the photographs. They're very clear and I can see the process. Um, my, it, in terms of the beginning, I, I think it would be useful to um, find a bit more sources in terms of, you know, your, you've got your synthetic source, and then you have your potential um, organic natural source. So I would start doing um, a, 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 a supply chain for the, authentic, um, the <coughs> synthetic one and a supply mm -hmm. chain for this, um, the natural real one. So that's the first thing that I would ask you to do. Secondly, um, the okay. pictures with, hello? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can hear. You. Okay. Secondly, the, the 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 pictures with the ladies, they're great, and I would like to just see a little bit more pictures of the, um, you know, when you, who is the first person that you give the wool to, and who is the last person in your factory that you um um has the wool, and who do they then give it to? So the very first person who, who touches it, um, mm -hmm. and then when it's, whatever, whenever you've done whatever you've done to it, who is the last person and who do they hand it to? So is it, yeah. is it, is it a shop owner? Is it, I mean, I, I don't know. You know, you know your process. So I'd like okay. to, yeah, I'd like to see the key people Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's almost like, you know, hand that, that person is handed, that person mm -hmm. is handed. So the mm -hmm. order, mm -hmm. the sequence, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say that to everybody else, mm -hmm. this, this applies to everyone else. What, you know, what is the sequence? Mm -hmm. Some of you may, there may be some stages where you will work together. Like, um, there's that scene there where the ladies are all together. Um, but there are some there are some stages where it's one person. So I'd like you to have the sequence. Then once it leaves you, who does it go to? And then, um, as much as possible, if you can if you can have pictures of the stages that it goes to, and then it gets into the hand of the consumer. So there's that lady there at the top with the telephone in her hand. I'm assuming that she's one of your consumers. Christelle? Yeah. 
yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and then um yeah, and and then what I want from uh, in terms of her, show me twenty four hours of her life. How does she okay. use? Yeah, then then I think you've got um an incredibly detailed um um on supply chain so so you'll have the the all of the stuff that you do that other people don't see but you need to see so that you understand the value that you're adding and do it um for for the the synthetic and for the um natural some of them may be yeah some of them may be similar steps some of them may you know, so some of them may share a step, some of them may not. Um, then when it gets into your organization, who is the first person who touches and who is, okay. yeah, and who is the last person who, t who, who hands it over to whoever, you know, your distribution chain. And then when you get to your end customer, 24 hours. So, um, um, how does she first come across you? Um, what's her typical day? Does she, I mean, I don't know, you know, what kind of work would that woman do? What, you know, do, does she put on the outfits made from um, the crochet um, in the morning or is it in the afternoon? Are they, are they pieces for everyday wear or are they pieces for, you know, um, special occasion? So I'd, I'd like to see 24 hours, a typical 24 hours. Okay, so how long should this thing be? Just if, if you... I, I think I was like, I need to put like 100 pictures. Well, if you need to put 100 pictures, then you need to put 100 pictures. <laughs> yeah, not a, should, should, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think... You, oh, sorry. I think the more that you get detail into the supply chain and the, the process and the steps, and the more you can create as much detail as you can, you know, in, in the, uh, then you build up a, a, a complete picture. And this is an, an ongoing process. So this never stops. You know, whether it takes five pictures, 10 pictures, 100 pictures, that's not the issue. It's about understanding your value chain. All the way from the beginning, all the way through to the customer, and all the way through to, you know, that, that, that whole system. And, and therefore, also, currently, this is currently in Rwanda. Of course, your value chain will extend again once you seek to export your product, depending on the region or countries that you are seeking to export it into. So there is no number on how many images you should be putting there. Um, it's about understanding as much of the process that you can from start to finish and I also want to add something else I think mean, you know also think about sustainability issues so think about you know how how is the wool um, where does the wool come from um, the synthetic the synthetic product uh, what are the how are the how is the coloring done how's the dye done where do you get this product from um, who makes the product um, what impact does that have on their lives as well you know so be really clear about the fact that you're creating a, a wonderful, ethical, sustainable product that you ultimately deliver to the customer and by delivering that value to them. I think Deborah, you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in total agreement with um, what um, Daryl said. And what I want to add is that when you map it out with this much detail, first of all, it helps your management team because they can see the stages and i mean already some of your colleagues have said oh my god it's becoming clear that's the purpose of doing this so that your your management team they can look at it and they can say ah oh, at that point we might need to change it or add it or increase it or yeah so so, so that's the value of it um, also, from a branding point of view, and obviously um, um, Professor Kevin is going to um, um, take us in much more detail, it helps people to 
for themselves to get the picture of how amazing your work is. So then they value your work. So when you're thinking about collecting the, um, the many pictures, which I've asked for these particular stages, remember this, that it, 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 your management team, they can look at that. You know, there, there may be a day when you say, oh, I've got to go to Europe and visit Deborah, Natida and Daryl because, you know, I'm accepting an award, you know. But while I'm away, management team, you can look at the process and they can exactly see where they are. So, so it's a very useful manage, a very useful team, so that you can manage the process, as well as think about how you can improve the process, and it's an incredibly important tool for for creating the brand message. So, some of you have said, "Ah, oh, we've got problems with branding." Branding can only happen when. Um, um, we start to see what the story is, then we can then communicate it to the wider world. So this is why we're doing all of this work now behind the scenes where people can't see, but we're, we're developing the foundation. So those are, those are my thoughts there. And I'm sure it's a question that we can ask Kevin when he joins us, but um, you know, it, it's very, very easy for us as um, brand owners to fall back on just promoting and communicating the benefits of the product rather than the story rather than the emotional connection that you would like consumers to have with your message and your brand and i personally i can already see how equally how this can be generated into potential messages into images yeah. into communication strategies yeah um as well as helping you think through the product development processes and yeah. uh, and so on and distribution and pricing and so on here you've got some really great stories that you can are starting to tell about your brand and that doesn't happen a lot in rwanda there's a lot about left brain thinking about here's the product it's great isn't it buy and we sell but this is about developing really sophisticated messages because when you start to export your product, it's mm. really important that people understand the origins of your product. Yes. And as a made in Rwanda product, it's not just about the fact that it's from Rwanda, but what makes that unique and distinctive? Mm. And how are you going to create some disruption in the marketplace so that mm. you start to differentiate your brand, your story from any other knitwear garment? Mm. of which there are hundreds and thousands. Mm. Yeah, okay. Crystal? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you quite well. It, this is really some great intel. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bonfield, do you want to add? Can you see how this can therefore be used now for your telling the story of your wonderful educational toys yeah yeah sure sure and uh i understand well what what i have to do what i need to do it is background work that that is the invisible stuff below the surface that no one gets to see but it is these things that you're doing that creates your points of difference mm -hmm. Yeah, mm, so we mm. can all be busy being busy, uh, making things, doing things, selling things, buying things. It's the stuff underneath the surface that your competitors cannot see that you yeah, are sure. doing, the differences you are making. Okay, and it, it, therefore, no one's, and people will see it because it'll be articulated much more clearly and um, cogently and um, coherently through the, the products you're developing, through the pricing for those products, through the distribution channels, through the people you get involved in the process, whether you, the making of it, um, through to the selling of it. Um, so important. Uh, Wilson, can you, uh, welcome Wilson. I know you've been very busy with domestic tourism. It's a big issue right now in Rwanda. 
are you still there? Can you see how this can play a role in, in really differentiating your tourist business from, from others as you start to embark on the domestic and international tourism? Um, sure, sure, I see. Mm. Yeah? It's really uh, just, um, it's really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. In, in what way? What way is it interesting? How would that be, a, how can it relate to what you're doing? Uh, this is a uh, uh, supply chain. Yeah. Um, just as we said, I've been uh, uh, working on uh, different proposals. Yeah. But really, I didn't know the, the, just the process. But now I'm getting something from here. Super. Great. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is part of the process and it all builds up into a more complete picture. And, and we said to people from the beginning, yes, do the, do the mood board and then we'll do this and then we'll look at branding. But hopefully you can start to see how it all, it all comes together. It, everything does not happen in sequence. The things we are going through are, we have to go through them in sequence, but they all um, have an impact on everything you're doing to build up your business model. Christelle? Yeah. Yeah? So great stuff. Yeah, I can hear you. It's great seeing those pictures. And, um, you know, I think it's also important to think through the government organizations and the non-government organizations, the NGOs that might equally be involved at each and every stage of that process. Okay. Yeah. Who are the actors that are that could be barriers to you achieving what you want to achieve or can be um, can be facilitators in helping you achieve what you want to achieve? Um, Regis, I know you are there and um, thank you for joining us today. Can you hear me? Regis, are you there? Maybe he's not there. I thought he was there. Okay. I was going to ask Regis to explain the work he's doing in terms of Vita 8 and the, uh, the work he's doing with the Agricultural Board, but I don't think Regis is currently there. So, yeah. Deborah. Natida, maybe you'd like to add some thoughts. No, no, no. I, I, I think, I mean, my only thing, and I think I've said it already, is that part of your work is to make the invisible visible. And that's what this supply chain is doing. It helps you to grow confidence in what you're doing. So that's why the photographs. And um, I'm curious what David feels, what Ferru what Pacific on um, Regis, I'm, I'm curious um, how this is making you um, 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 think differently um, about um, your approach to clarifying your process. Yeah, um, I just want to add a couple of points. Uh, actually, just put this together, the value chain. Actually, uh, from the beginning of your business project, and um, consider these along with the point of contact, who you contact in each, mm. in each uh, point of, um, for example, the resources that you get and also people uh, who get in touch. So, and that's mean along each point within the value chain, each point should have um, a kind of value creation along the chain and within the value creation you can you know identify the person that would be a key stakeholder or uh, relevant people that involved in that process and how the value that you create can offer to them and not just those people also onto the market so i think along the value chain there's um, a good reason that you can do a market research along the way to just define that, why you need to create uh, those values. And like um, Daryl uh, mentioned about the sustainability from your source of uh, production, the materials, 
um, see if the market would uh, view on that. Is there any, any value from the market aspect as well, as long as from your business project? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Does anybody want to chip in there? Hello. Hello. Who's speaking? This is yeah, nothing speaking. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, there, there is something that I, I noticed while making my uh, value chain. I, I realized that uh, I, I should be involved in uh, in uh, seed plantation because uh, I've seen this. Uh, I've never seen this before. I didn't realize this before that open choice has a big impact in. Uh, forest destruction. So uh, I was thinking, is it a time maybe to join uh, forest? I don't know forest plantation. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. Go up mixing things. Yes. Are you are you talking about creating a partnership with a particular plantation? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. That's a great idea. I think, you know, that's something which Natila was talking about, being really clear about the sustainability issue. But then thinking through the ethics, how is it, how are the trees planted? How is it going to be cut down? Who are the labourers that do that? How do they live their lives? How are they rewarded as part of the process? Because, I mean, for example, there are many products around the world that are very, can be quite cheap, but actually somewhere, somewhere down the supply chain suffers. So you have to go right the way back to seeing how how that happens and you could really work closely perhaps with a district or a sector or with farmers and you could understand maybe in rwanda the ngos that you could be working with to make that happen maybe there are some sustainability issues there in terms of um, working closely with with government um, organizations mm -hmm. ministries Mm -hmm. so you can create a really sustainable organic toy that is not just good for your ch for the children but is also really great for the environment yeah sure yeah yeah and sure. and i think that's really we talked about that in the first week and that's why if you look at you know the government of rwanda is very committed to you thinking through the sustainability development goals the global goals that are there to uh, protect Rwandan society as well as enable you to turn, uh, benefit from that in turning it into a commercial opportunity. But there has to be a balance between making sure that the goals are being delivered upon so that you're supporting the national strategy, so you're supporting the Rwanda recovery plan, so you're really clear about how you support uh, social protection strategies that are in place within the nst but also you're seeing a way in which you can you can utilize that that, that those goals and those targets to develop your enterprise as a made in rwanda enterprise yeah sure thank you thank you so that's that's a long way of saying in, have those discussions the more conversations you have with the people actors in the supply chain they will lead you to something which will lead you to something else which will lead you to something you haven't even yet considered yeah sure yeah sure yeah, i know some in initiatives like uh green kigali something like this uh, uh I, I know some initiative of, of planting uh, trees in, in in villages yeah to yeah. really storing some uh national parks I was thinking, is it a time maybe to join them as someone who uh, has that role in the forestation? If you, I can you, say that. You have, the, convers you have the, convers it. you have the conversation. Yeah, sure. You have no, don't have any um, prediction about what the outcome might be. But you mm -hmm. see, the clearer you are about your value proposition to the market, Mm -hmm. And the more you can articulate that to these stakeholders, the more they're going to be able to understand what it is you're trying to achieve, what your aims and objectives are, that you're serious, that you're credible, and they can see a role to play. So this is, 
don't see them as cons they, they shouldn't see themselves as, as a consumer as a supplier of just providing you with something the conversations you have enable them to become co-creators in the product mm. development process with you sure and you're seen to be also being really authentic in understanding what's important to them yes and that and that that doesn't happen overnight that does take time yeah, but that's sure. why having those convert that's a great way that you're thinking by the way um begin to think like that and you know look at what it is that government of rwanda says is important i'm i think what i'm going to hack i'm going to share with you all the the national strategy uh, if you haven't already seen it or i think many of you have and indeed the, the rwanda recovery plan and you mm -hmm. just look in there and you see okay what role can i play with my business in yes. supporting rwanda's recovery plan over the next 6 12 18 24 months yeah sure it's it's there for us it's there it's laid out as the blueprint okay but government can't do any everything they want public and private sector to work together in the national interest yeah, yeah? sure yeah, before my focus was just uh, making tools and selling yeah. them yeah yeah <laughs> and, and why wouldn't it be of course making toys and selling them that is absolutely at the at the heart of it that's what you're doing <laughs> but the how the what the why the when the who the where yeah really important that you understand those issues and the clearer you are in thinking about those issues then clearly the more you are articulating articulating yeah. a sustainable brand yeah sure 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 yeah yeah. Deborah, yeah. Deborah, anybody? Would anybody like to pop in there? Deborah, are you still there? Deborah, I I am here. I was my my technology was playing up. Um, so yes, I'm I'm in full agreement. I I think we've been joined by someone. So that's the pleasure to see. Um, we've we've been joined by, um, someone. But let's just focus on that. Your job is to be really absolutely clear about what is your customer's uh, pain, struggle, frustration. So as something as simple as a toy, what, 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 what's, been, what's been their issue um, around getting the right kind of toy? What's been their frustration, their challenge? And the more that you really can articulate that and then answer um, um not only answer that but um provide your solution then you are regarded as the first choice for toys because you have answered not only their question but you you demonstrate to them that you are truly paying attention what to what matters to them that's what we mean by value. So each time you hear us use the words value, 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 value is about, are you listening to me so closely that you give me exactly what resolves my challenge, pain, frustration? So it's not just a toy. It's like, what type of toy? You know, what shape of toy? Because there are toys already around. But what is the frustration that, that, that one has with the existing um, um, offers out there in whatever sector, Christel sector, Regis sector, Bonfield, you know, what's the current frustrations and then how do you meet it more closely than anyone else in a way that also um, ensures that you are in harmony with nature, with your environment, hence sustainability. So that's what I think you should always remember. So be comfortable with asking people about their frustrations, their challenges, their, and sometimes they're not gonna say to you in your face, but you can have private conversations and say, what's the real issue here? And then, because really we are, we are servants, being entrepreneurs, we are, we are serving them. And that's what value is. We are serving them. It's not about us. It's about 
how deeply we are listening to what matters to them and then how closely we can match what we do to them. So that's, that's really what I wanted to share there. Fantastic. And while we've been having that wonderful discussion about the value chain and creating sustainable value chains, um, I can see that we have been joined by Kevin Lane Keller. Good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon or good morning in my case. Oh, good morning to you. Welcome to our session. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think we've also been joined by um, Peter Bonfield from University of Westminster. Yeah, hello, Daryl. Good to see you. Good, good to see you. So we've been talking, um, Kevin and Peter, thank you so much for joining us. We've been working with the uh, young entrepreneurs over the past few weeks, really thinking through how they create um, how they revisit their business model as they come out of COVID-19. Um, many of these young entrepreneurs have developed businesses over the last two to three years, and we're, we're guiding them now in terms of articulating their brand in a different way, developing a new sustainable business model and a more stronger sustainable brand. So I know that sustainability and branding is something that both you, Peter, and you, Kevin, are very strong on. So, Kevin, if, if I may start with you, you know, we're in this really period of uncertainty. Much is said about the new normal. Um, in terms of brand development and brand building, what, what would you say is, firstly, to our young entrepreneurs, what, is a, what builds a successful brand? And what are the key ingredients that they really need to think about right now? Yeah, the thing with a brand is you, and it very much builds on uh, what I caught at the very end uh, as I came in about value chain and a value system. It, it really is how you create value for customers. And the thing about a brand, a brand is all about creating awareness and differentiation. So you want to make sure people know who you are and also how you're different and from competitors in, in different ways. So, you know, fundamentally that's the, you know, that is the, the role of the brand. That's not going to change. That's always been the case. Um, the issue now is, is sort of how you differentiate yourself. And then also there's something else that's very important about a, about a brand. And that's also where you sort of break even on. And I'm going to talk about that in, in a second. But, uh, but one other quick point. So the, the power of a brand resides in the minds and hearts of your customers. So ultimately, that's what, you know, a, a brand technically is a name, you know, logo, your symbol. You know, that's literally what I call brand elements. But the power of a brand is much more what's inside people's heads and hearts and how it affects how they think and feel. And as an entrepreneur, that's what I want to figure out is how do I want them to think and feel? And I think going forward, it's going to be really important to find what those differentiators are. And I think that's some of the value system in terms of how you create value, either intrinsically or extrinsically, how the product or service works, but also maybe some of the imagery and other associations around what you do. So you need to have both kinds. And, and I call those points of difference. So at the same time, really important to have what I call points of parity. That's where you break even. That's where you don't have any weaknesses. So your points of difference are where strong, favorable, unique associations. There are things you have that you know, other customers can't get anywhere else. Points of parity are where you break even. And I think in a COVID world, it's going to be really important to make sure that you have what I call points of parity. You have all the sort of necessary, what safety, health, hygiene, you know, uh, uh, maybe financial related, so that your advantages can actually matter. So think of it this way. What you want to do is you want to try to neutralize any potential disadvantage that you have. Anything about the questions that a customer may have, is it safe? Is it, can I trust it? You know, in a, in a post-COVID world. At the same time, you have to have things that make you 
the strengths or advantages, you know, that there are reasons to buy you. There's something, I always talk about three factors, desirable, deliverable, differentiated. So when you're building your brand, your points of difference, they should be desirable, deliverable, differentiating. So what is it that you're offering that people really want that they can't get anywhere else and, and um, that you can truly deliver on? Mm-hmm. So think of those three factors. So, so long answer, because building a brand <laughs> takes a lot. <laughs> there's, a lot there's a lot to that. But the, to me, the core thing I wanted to get across in the post-COVID world, the neutralizing parity are going to be really important but you don't you know, lose sight of your points of difference and balancing those two will be really important. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll come back to some of those issues, really important issues for young entrepreneurs to be considering. Certainly in an emergent development economy such as Rwanda where resources are scarce and there's a lot of emphasis put on um, from the government in terms of what is it you're contributing in the national interest? How does your brand contribute to the the national economy and what contribution are you making sustainably, ethically, and and also coherently in order to build a sustainable business going forwards. If I can just come in with Peter, you you talk you're very about sustainability issues for today's business. I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of developing a sustainable business for young entrepreneurs, what it is a you be, you feel sustainability means and what you think is important in terms of developing going forwards, both personally um, and also in terms of developing a business. Okay, well, thank you, Daryl, and good to be with you all. Um, I want to pick up on the value word. I want to link what your question to the value word, and but add an S, values. Um, a thing that's really, really important is what you as an entrepreneur stand for. What are, you, what are your core values? What do you believe in? Why should people trust you? How is what service you're offering or what product you're offering? What's its authenticity? And um, you know, a really, really important part of developing a reputation, you could call it a brand, it might look like, it might have logos, is is really about who you are, what you stand for, and being utterly consistent in your behaviors and the way in which you respond to those values. And um, you know, as the world, orients more around this, things like the sustainable United Nations Sustainable Development, Development Goals, which is pushing for more equality, eradicating poverty, um, getting clean water, dealing with climate change and things like that. Um, increasingly, governments, businesses, the public, people are looking for ethical, trusted products and services that they can uh, buy into. Uh, feel good about and know, know they're doing the right thing about about those things too because the thing too about your brand or your reputation is it's long lasting when you when you're starting out you know and you're under a bit of pressure or duress to to make your idea a sort of commercial reality there can be a lots of pressures on you to take actions that may seem short term but actually being authentic to who you are and what you stand through and maintaining that consistently through through your working life uh, makes a huge impact on success at the end of the day and and also on how you feel about your success and and as as you go through your careers you know how you feel about your success is is often as important or more important than the success itself so i think i think um when it comes to sustainability being clear on who you are and what you stand for what your values are how you can be trusted and then being relentlessly authentic around that is, is really critical, Daryl. Thank you so much. And, and, and Peter, would you bring that back into the, uh, Kevin, would you bring that back into the, the branding world? They all need to be authentic. They need to be consistent in, in your messaging as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Peter. I th- you know, I think it's value and values. And so I think he said it well. I always talk about intrinsics and extrinsics. And intrinsics are truly the value part of the equation in how you deliver uh, um, value. And to your point about authenticity and consistency, the whole point about a brand is it's about predictability. It's about the fact you're reducing risk, that setting expectations, and especially for an entrepreneur who is trying to establish his self or herself in the marketplace, 
you know, the ability to give that predictable performance to, so people know what they're going to get is really, really fundamental. And value is a, always hugely important. I, I, you know, any, any time, anywhere. It's because it's, people have to give up money and in an economy where money is tight mm -hmm. or in a part of the world where money is tight. It's just so important to get the value part of the equation correct. But to Peter's point, there's also what these extrinsics and they're what you represent. And again, it may be from government pressure. It may be from your own desires and own uh, aspirations, your own beliefs about what you want to stand for and how you other aspects of what your brand's about. And obviously sustainable has, can actually speak to both value and values and how you make something as well as you know, in the physical or the service even that you deliver and as well as what it represents. So I, I, I think that balance is really, really important in understanding both sides of those. Absolutely, because in this situation, the, the entrepreneur is both developing a brand and is the face of the brand and embodies the brand. So the ability, the need to be coherent and res the resonance between both the personal brand and the, the corporate brand are intertwined. Yeah, they are. And, and, and Daryl, I just, we're, we're both University of Westminster. And so we're, we're nearly 3,000 colleagues and we're about 19,500 students that come from all around the world and a myriad of different backgrounds. And, and we have some values, however, however, whatever words you use that we sort of share, we we're, tend to be very ethical people, um, do, always doing the right thing, not being afraid to ensure that everything's done as it should be. So, so ethics and being responsible underpin all I do. We're really compassionate people. We work at our university because, uh, because we really care about our students and we really care about the fact they come from such a diverse um, diverse places around the world and diverse um, backgrounds. You know, it's every single one of them, about two and a half thousand students is an individual that matters. And also really progressive as a university. And um, so we're pioneering and innovating and trying new things. And that was evidenced, I think, well by the coronavirus problem where Early on, we locked down. We distributed our students to some 140 countries uh, back home. We, just, we put our, our colleagues back home quickly before the lockdown uh, uh, impacted the whole of the UK here. Um, but then that was innovative. We moved online. We put all our university onto a digital twin. But what was brilliant was that every one of um, our colleagues responded really compassionately really caring for each other, caring for their students, reaching out, making sure they're properly communicated with, worrying if they didn't have laptops and things like that and making sure they had them. And, and so in terms of our university, our behaviors were based on our values, these responsible, ethical, compassionate and pioneering values shared and felt by everybody across our university, delivering the best experience in very difficult times for our students looking out for each other as well and the point about that is that's like a real test so when the chips are down when the pressure is really on the question is do you really behave by and adhere to your core values and the principles the things that you, you hope and you think are authentically you or not and i think you know certainly for westminster that was a great example of how the values and the authenticity have worked well and hopefully you know, our, our students know how we've responded. Our colleagues know how we've valued and cared for each other. So going forward in terms of our reputation, you know, hopefully that is an enhancing measure for our reputation that will help us to, to build on this awful circumstance with the virus, with the virus and continue to, to deliver, you know, outstanding outcomes for our students. And that's where, you know, so, so as entrepreneurs on the call become more successful and they're probably more people, it's really important too, even more important then, that the values, the things you believe in that your, your, your business is based on are shared by others in your, in your business as it grows because they ultimately hold the reputation of your precious idea and yourselves in their hands. So yes, yeah, another, another example of how, how value can come from sharing and being clear about your values and, and always and inherently behaving against those values. Thanks.
So Daryl, I think you're on mute. Like, there you go. I was just gonna say, building on what Peter said, the importance of leadership in developing strong brand values. And you must see lots of examples of brands at the moment that are doing the right thing, some that could do better. And before we open it out to our young entrepreneurs, can you just maybe share some examples about things that you think are going well and how important leadership is in that, in that facilitation of developing strong brand values? Yeah, let me actually, let me just link back real quick to Peter's comment and then I'll bring it into leadership. But so Peter, I think Peter made a really good point about just how important your, in terms of reputation or brand, every contact point matters. And that's the, the last one is when you're talking about the whole organization, certainly in a moment of crisis, but anytime I come into contact with your business for any mm. reason, that can affect how I think or feel about that. Mm -hmm. about you and that business and that's so fundamentally important because that is the power of a brand is in the minds and hearts of customers i said that earlier it's what they think but it's also what they feel and both matter so you have to be always aware of that make every little thing matters and so you want to kind of keep that in in mind i you know i think the main thing with leadership um the challenge is always delivering on a brand promise so when you think about it, your brand, there's a promise. I said a brand's all about setting expectations, reducing risk, and a promise. Delivering on that promise. It's when you have to deliver on that promise in, in hard times or make tough decisions, you know, sort of where you see the, the leadership kind of come in. And, and some of it is where you, again, live up to your, your values in terms of what you believe in and how you care about your employees as much as your customers and you recognize how important that is the internal and the external so i think the other thing that i think i'll build up build off of peter's comments is there's an internal side and an external side to branding it's branding is you're going to always be concerned about your customers and your di distributors your suppliers and and all of that but at the same time you have to be concerned about your employees and what they and making sure they live the brand that they understand what the promise is and they make sure everything they do is consistent with that and that's especially true in in, in sort of hard times so i'll stop there we can move to questions i know deborah and has had several questions and i don't know if we want to start there because i've been seeing them on chat so happy okay to sure 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 well, so, so Yes, Harry, let's open it out. Yeah, guys, who would like to go first and speak with uh, Kevin and Peter? Bonfil? Yeah, thank you so much, Daru. Uh, hello, uh, Kevin and, uh, and Peter Bonfield. Please go ahead, Bonfil. Yep, go thank ahead. you so much. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank Hello. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a it's a great pleasure, really. It's an honor to hear from you, all of you. It's really amazing. Uh, thank you, uh, Deborah and Darrell, for the invitation for today's session. Uh, my question is, uh, how can we uh, make difference difference uh, within this period? Uh, and dealing with the limited time and money. Well, I'll, I'll say something and Peter, Peter can jump in. I think the thing about a brand, it's funny, a lot of people think you need lots of money to build brands. And I have all these examples of brands that had, you know, didn't spend any on ad, money on advertising and uh, even like Starbucks, famous you know, global brand, you know, they didn't advertise for years. So it, it really is about creating experiences for customers that uh, your customers that they that they value and that they are going to want to talk to others about. And word of mouth is the best way to build a brand. You know, it's letting people you know share experiences and people talk about you or write about you or post about you or, or anything like that. So, so, you know, I think the thing, I'm not sure in this crisis that with, you know, there's so much going on, it's a pretty noisy environment. I, I think it's, 
mo most of what I would be trying to do is trying to make sure I established my brand and maintained my brand and to make sure that it, that I am doing the things to keep it strong and delivering on that promise. But I think in, in terms of real growth with such a tough economic environment and so many other challenges, I'm not sure, you know, you, you always have that opportunity because great brands are born out of opportunity. You know, they somehow find that, that way to do it. But if you don't see it, I think that's okay as long as you are doing the things to create the foundation that you can build from when things become a bit more normal and that you might be able to create more engagement mm. with your customers and they might be the experiences themselves may be just richer because they're not constrained as much. I mean, that would be my thoughts. Uh, yeah. So, so, so Bonfield, what Bonfield didn't say is that he's developing a wonderful educational toy company in Rwanda using local wood, local craftsmen, aiming at local schools and local preschool and young children. So of course, schools are currently in lockdown till September. So this is an opportunity you're saying for him to really do the background work to keep the brand out there. Um, what would you say, encouraging use of digital and so on just to get the messages out there? How would you suggest he goes forward for the next few months? Yeah, I mean, if you actually do have, uh, if, again, it's, it's all about the you know, needs for customers and their desires and what you can do to satisfy them. And if you have a situation where you have special needs related to this pandemic, you know, this crisis that we have that can help satisfy needs, it is a great opportunity to sort of move forward. And it probably is fairly organic. I don't, you know, I think it's something where trying to uh, find those opportunities, find those places and letting the word get out in some ways and finding ways to promote that, whether it's, um, online, socially, or, or otherwise, but, but tapping into that. And, and, and I think part of it's also, a lot of um, building a brand is, you know, it's like I said, it's like a recommendation that somebody has. It's one of the most powerful, a friend, mm. family member, it's just so powerful. So mm. in this environment in Rwanda, I'd be thinking about, you know, with the schools or, you know, with schools out, whatever, and finding the ways to mm. reach people in their homes where they, talked about it, shared it in some form, in form of a recommendation and in effect an, uh, a testimonial endorsement, those kinds of things. So I might be thinking of, of that in, in, uh, as yeah. a way to do this. Bonfield. Um, Bonfield. Have, Peter, how yeah. does that, yeah. Peter. Um, yeah, so Peter here, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. sure, I can hear you. Yeah, so um, I mean, there's a general sort of philosophy in life, isn't there, which is, um, about giving and it seems that those that give and think about giving is end up getting more so you know if you if the market you're aiming at isn't in place now the question is you know during these really really difficult times is there something you could give i don't know online or maybe physically to parallel markets or other things that help people during this difficult period and, and the reason for doing it is because it's a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's an ethical thing to do. It's a good thing for potential society. But of course, um, as we just heard from Kevin, in doing so, your reputation will grow. The core values and the things you stand for will grow. Your reputation will probably improve and you may have better prospects for, for growing your market when things settle down and, and come back to normal. So, um, I don't know, there might be some contributions you can make somehow to people who are uh, in need at this time with your product that might, that might help. Um, the other question, of course, is are, are, from purely business markets, are there other places where your products could go, in particular for this market, but are there other markets in other places you might be able to um, get into and, and investigate a little? during this period. Uh, um, the other thing too is any, any, every entrepreneur has periods where, well, hopefully every, every entrepreneur has periods where they're doing really, really well. Um, but usually there are also periods where things are really tough and hard and hard. That's absolutely normal. 
for entrepreneurs. And, and when those things happen, you know, it's about really focusing on the fewest things that allow your idea um, to keep itself going whilst maybe finding other ways to uh, make a living in, in those periods until, until things come back. So, um, yeah, think what you might give to improve things. Think about parallel markets. And if you need to bide your time and sort of maybe there's some other things you can find to do at the moment, maybe not. I don't know your circumstances whilst focus on the very few things that keep your idea alive in the meantime. Good luck anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bonko, yeah. how was how was that the information, the advice you've been given? Do you want to so so inspiring, so inspiring and so fruitful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What do you think you can take away from that and do, you know, when we leave this session today? Out of that that, that Peter and Kevin have just shared with you, what do you think is the, the takeaway for the for you to be working on? Yeah, sure. I'm going to keep branding my my my, my, my product. Uh, on social media, on uh, advertising on radio, as well as TV, uh, and also keep that uh, uh, that trust from my my customers. I mean, I mean, Kevin, you made a really great point about involving the customer in the story, you know. And here we are in lockdown, and Rwanda's economy, you know, is 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 been hit quite badly. Is this an opportunity, therefore, to really engage, as you say, with the customers in that, in the messaging? The testimonials is a wonderful idea to get them to play with the product and to, to share and learn. Yeah, that's, is that a way forward for these yeah. types of guys? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that is there. I was just pausing because my internet connection was unstable. So hopefully yeah, we got you, you hear me okay. The, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Okay, good. But the, um, yeah, no, I, 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 I mean, I think that's right. It's, it is, and, I, and again, I want to build on Peter's point. So I'm getting, Peter's making some just great points. And the idea of focus, you know, that in, in these times, it's challenging. I think the idea, I think it was sort of a, more the last point I think you made of, of the three, the giving is great. And, you know, all, all three points I thought really good in parallel markets. But the, that notion of trying to focus and, and really, you know, make sure that you kind of double down on delivering the promise, if, if you will, in that way. And then I think to your question, Daryl, I think then that is where you can get people to share experiences with you. And in, and in many ways, even his, uh, you could certainly his first point, the giving point, sometimes a little can give you a lot. Mm -hmm. And just the, the actions that you take just mm -hmm. by showing that you care mm -hmm. and that you care about customers, I think mm -hmm. that's, so important i think a lot of times customers don't feel like they're getting the attention and and so mm -hmm. so sometimes just a little can can do a lot so that's that's worth i think thinking about uh too as a way to just in a very uh, efficiently and very brand consistent so the more it can be done in a way that reflects the value and values of your brand the better off you'll, you'll be with that i think great advice and I, if I might add something else, Bonfield, is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So, so an another thing that's really important, you know, if, if you're on a, a patch where it's a bit slow or, you know, you're waiting for things to, to unlock, you, you should think about your own morale and spirit and, and well-being as well. Um, you know, it can be quite disillusioning to be in a patch where you've got this great idea and you want to get it out there so also thinking about your own need and if you have people you're working with their needs just to to have a few goals to go at you know as as kevin and i may have just described that you can you can go for go go towards create some impact even if they're relatively small milestones so you you feel you're progressing um because you know one, one of the really important difficult things to maintain for any entrepreneur especially when things are difficult or not going quite as you want, is your, is your own uh, confidence. And uh, I don't mean arrogance, I mean confidence, but you need, often you're on your own, entrepreneurs are on their own, and they need something that they can sort of fall back on that's like their emotional platform to go forward with. So again, if you can tease out, even if the market is hopeless for you at the moment because schools are locked down, having some things you go at and go for, 
uh, would be very welcome. And on, on the focus point, again, if I go back to our university, you know, when we put everything online on a digital twin, we did it in real time, 22 and a half thousand people having dispersed them around the world. That was a massive task. It, mm. cr it created, I mean, it required a huge amount of energy. And what happened during that patch was we, you know, all pretty well, just focused our energy on the fewest things that mattered and all the normal things that you think are important, but you realize aren't just went by the wayside so that we could really focus on delivering for our students what we wished for. Anyway, there we are. Yeah, Thank you. Yes, Bonfil? Uh, could you please allow me to... Please carry on. And then I know Wilson has a question, so... Please. I know many really... Uh, one more. Have questions. Yeah, yeah fine. one more. The last one. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Kevin or Peter are going to answer this. Uh, the question is, before we didn't have toys here in Rwanda, mm. especially to those to toddlers, uh, uh, nursery schools and primary schools, only international schools uh, such as Montessori, Cambridge, Tiffin, here in Rwanda, they, they, they had before. They, they only have. So today I, I brought that idea to make toys for every every school here in Rwanda, nursery schools. Uh, the only toys that uh, were allowed to come here in Rwanda, they were brought by uh, UNICEF uh, as grants to schools. But the problem was they were not referred to the curriculum. Curr of so that's what I brought as an innovation to refer them to the curriculum of Rwanda. So I'm thinking to expand my business in East Africa, in, uh, in Africa, so am I going to refer every toy that I make to the curriculum of each and every country, or am I really going to make them on international standards? Thank you. Are you talking about standards? I, I, I was saying, uh, am I going to make toys refer to the curriculum of each and every country that I'm thinking to uh, export, uh -huh. or I'm going oh. to make them on international standards. Well, I, let me just chip in. I know that next week we're we're being joined by Professor Sven Hollandson, who's again one of the best global experts on international marketing and looking at standardising and adapting your product for those different markets. But I, I think there's an important issue about branding. Do you create, do Kevin, a consistent brand? Some brands are creating, you know, coherent brands globally. Um, locally, how do you manage those two, two, uh, two issues, the local and the global? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the thing that you find is that the most successful global brands are the ones, they have a promise that's global, that is meaningful and desirable, and that, as I said before, and relevant to many people, but, but at the same time, they, they also adapt it locally. So think global, act local. So they find ways to deliver on that, where there's Coca-Cola, I'll just use the American brands that I'm familiar with and have worked with, uh, Nike, you know, American Express brands like that, they'll figure out what it is. And so Nike's all about performance and authenticity, but performance and authenticity in sport is different in Rwanda than it is in mm. UK versus in the United States, you know, versus, you know, Brazil and Japan and other parts of the world. So, so I think that's the, Thing. And, and then there's issues about standards is, and, and I'll, I'll defer that to the professor that's coming <laughs> soon. So, cause that, that's, that's got some specific issues. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bonfield. Some great questions and we hope that's helped for, for now. Um, I know that Wilson, you've been waiting to ask Kevin a question. So hopefully you're still there and hopefully you can ask Kevin your question now. Yes, and, I'm here. Thank and you Wilson, much. just explain what it is that you do and then that will provide some context. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin, and Dare, and Peter, and uh, just all of you. Wilson to us is a founder and the manager of Wilson to us Travel Agency Limited. We are based in Rwanda, company born to promote domestic tourism. We are in domestic tourism, just um, uh, a career. 
and the Wilson was born to um, create many jobs in Guanan youth through uh, tourism mm -hmm. and uh, just increase uh, tourism product. That's what Wilson does. Got Wilson it. Tours does. That sounds great. So, no, good, good, good. good. Um, sorry, I uh, haven't been with you for the last session, but I tried to catch up. <clears throat> and if so, I can just put some context there for Kevin, you know, Rwanda is a very tourism reliant country. It's built its tourism over the last uh, few years to be very successful. Around 10% of GDP comes from inward tourism. But now it's been hit, clearly, you know, and that is why there's now a movement as part of the Rwanda recovery plan to domestic tourism. So, so Wilson, what would be your question? Yeah, sure. And before I go to my, my question, uh, come and enjoy the wonders of Rwanda. <laughs> so now my question is, uh, mm, I've been, as I said before, I've been working on uh, uh, proposals on how we can recover uh, tourism, uh, especially domestic tourism in Rwanda. Um, we've been talking about uh, branding, branding. Mr. Kevin, uh, just is there just a step, or the, just are there steps to follow? Uh, just in branding, when we are in normal life, and when in the, uh, a critical uh, uh, situation like this one. Uh, thank you very much. No, good, good question, Wilson. Now, look, a lot of the fundamentals still apply. I think you're going to, you know, a lot of this is trying to create the points of difference and points of parity. And with tourism, it's trying to get people to understand and appreciate the positives and the experience and what they get out of it and why it's worth doing. But in these situations, the point of parity is really critical and making sure people feel comfortable and kind of eliminating any of those disadvantages I talked about earlier. And I have two points about each of those, or one point about each of those. Uh, on the point of parity, it's sometimes you really have to like double or triple down, you know, in, in terms of trying to really reassure people. So if there is a negative that you're dealing with uh, in any form, you want to make sure you, you really, really address it. Just get it off the table so that that, that is not a problem as much as you can do that. And I know that can be challenging, but that's always what I recommend. And, and then on the, I will say on the positive side, the one thing we haven't talked about, I, I'm a big fan, and especially with tourism, slogans are so helpful. That's a branding device, you know, it's a short expression. A slogan can be, you know, really, really um, helpful. And in tourism, there are some great examples around the world of slogans, whether it's Jamaica or India or whatever, incredible India, that's what they advertise. And so just having a slogan that you use to remind and reinforce can be a kind of a hook, if you will, into the message you're trying to get across in domestically. So I'd be thinking about that as it's just so important, it seems in tourism to be able to package that you know, in a very compact way. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Kelvin. Good luck, well, good luck, Wilson. Good luck. Thank you, thank you. I was on mute then, so Peter couldn't hear me. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna ask Peter if he'd like to add anything there, given you know we're under developing a sustainable tourism sector. What can young organisations like uh, Wilson's do right now? Yeah, well, Kevin's tip was a really good one. Being you know, having some descriptor, some slogan that describes things, and I think the difference between now and the future is uh, uh, who, who is it was speaking just before we came on? Was it Deborah? Well, um, before, yes, Deborah. No, just, yeah. Deborah Rose, yeah, anyway, yeah, she was saying um, some sort of wise words about really thinking what your customers are thinking and what your customers are worrying about that's different. And so now there might be 
you know, different challenges to normal. People might be I don't, more worried about certain things. So when you're promoting your, your wonderful tours against the slogan, something that reassures customers that the thing they'd be worrying about at the moment or the things they'd be worrying about, you understand and you're aware of and you can assure them that, that they're okay uh, would be an important thing to do. And then that message may, of course, change as people or your, your customers are worried about other things or looking for other things. So I think you've just got to be in tune with your customers in the marketplace so that your messaging and your communications with them are optimized. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you so much. I'm delighted to say that we're also joined now by Her Excellency uh, Paula Ingevira, Minister for ICT Innovation. Welcome, Paula. I hope you can hear us and thank you for joining our session. We're currently talking about branding and brand management and creating sustainable organizations so that our young entrepreneurs can pivot to the new economic landscape and we can create some disruption in the way that they start to think about their business models going forwards. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Christelle, I know that Christelle, you have a question for Kevin, firstly, so would you like to ask Christelle, uh, Kevin the question? Yeah, Daryl, thank you. Uh, my, uh, my name is Christelle, I work in the fashion industry, in the craft business. We do knitting and crocheting and reproduce uh, knitwear which has a modern twist. Uh, in the, I have a question about branding in the fashion industry, as it is a very competitive industry where, like, the competition is fierce and there are people with a lot of resources. So I might. Hello, Christelle. Christelle, are you there? We were getting to the good part. We were getting to the good part. Christelle, you seem to have, ah, she's back. Christelle. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, my, my connection was acting up. My name is Christelle. I work in the fashion industry, mm -hmm. in the craft uh, uh, subsex uh, subsector. We, we do knitting and crocheting, and we put a modern twist to it so that it gets more marketable. So my question for Kevin is, uh, what is your advice for the fashion industry where the competition is very fierce? If you have limited resources and you brand your product, it's really easy to copy. How, how do you deal with that and uh, get to be successful uh, in that area? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there, there are two things I'd probably think about in, um, and that's tough. I agree. It's a very competitive business and it's very challenging, but the, that's the, on the hard side on the, on the good side is it is one of the businesses where the word of mouth can be so powerful in the social effects and influence so that if you manage to tap into kind of people's, you know, tastes and their preferences and, you know, things can re re really take off. You know, I, one thing in branding, it's often really nice to have a flagship product. You know, like there's one distinctive product. I worked with Nivea, you know, for years, Nivea Cream, buyer store. And, and their Nivea Cream, they have lots of Nivea products. Nivea makes all kinds of different products. The cream was their sort of flagship. And by flagship, what I mean by that is, it is sort of the one product that really represents the brand well. And that is, you know, distinctive, that people value. And you can really go far with that one product. There are lots of examples of this. So if I'm in the fashion space and I can give you like a Stuart Weitzman in the U and I don't know Stuart Weitzman, I think most of the U S maybe, but it's shoes, women's sh uh, shoes. They have very, a couple of very distinctive models that um, kind of define the brand and help to, uh, uh, I think, build the brand and spread the word. So I'd be looking for that. If there's like a distinctive, you know, line in particular, or even item, but, but variations maybe, but a line that kind of embodies you really well that you can use in just that one, it can be literally one item that is the, that people really like and that makes, makes it clear what you're about. Um, I'd be thinking about that. 
And, and, and just before you, we, you joined us, one of the things that Chris Dell was articulating was the value chain, the value map going right the way back to the, the source, you know, the knitwear, the wool, where the wool comes from, where it comes in, and then she involves local village, uh, the villages in making the products, and then it goes to, to, to the market, and then it is turned into these amazing products that people can buy. And again, going back to this authenticity, this made in Rwanda brand, you think that selling that story about the source and the, the ethical dimension of the product as well may create some points of difference. Absolutely, yeah, no, no, no question. So, and it's just finding, uh, put, finding the best way to tell that story if on a product platform, if you will, is, is the key to blend that. Make sure those extrinsics of the story get blended with a really strong intrinsic product that you can then bring it forward. Right. And Peter, I'd love you to add in here about sustainability issues in terms of developing fashion products. There's a lot sort of criticism to fast fashion and so on. So again, in sustainable fashion and sustainability of product, yeah, what do you think it's important here. In well, it's really important, and yeah. and Crystal, it sounds like you've got a fantastic story, and it's a very sought after story. Um, you know, there's a lot of worry in the fashion industry about um, exploitation of people and the environment, and uh, you know, some awful stories. So, if you've got a really authentic story, as well as if you've got a really cool product that's very distinctive that um, people wear because it looks great, that's Brilliant. And if you can add to that something about you and your story and your passion and your authenticity. So not only does a product look great, but it's just the whole story around it is something you feel proud to wear. And, and the, the, the thing, the, the, really, um, the really thing to try and tease out there is, or to test yourself on, is how your customers talk about your product to their friends or to others. Uh, Partly it can be about look at this amazing, you know, look at this amazing crocheting or knitwear. It doesn't look, doesn't look, make, look great. And, and by the way, do you know it's made by Crystal who, who does sources locally and employs local people and it's doing great things for a responsible ethical things by Rwanda. So if you've got a product that's distinctive and people who can tell your story with it, then, then you're, you're much more likely to succeed in a, in a very, very difficult marketplace. It'll bring brand loyalty. I don't know too whether, um, you know, in terms of spreading spreading the word. Sometimes the most powerful way of spreading the word on this is actually to have people who others recognise, um, whose opinions are respected. That that not only wear your product, but also tell the story of the product. That can be a powerful way of differentiating yourself in a very crowded marketplace. Yeah. The sure. point is though, then you must stay true to your 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 value all that you know, the product you're procuring your supply chain is really ethical and solid and doing the right thing anyway very good luck crystal <laughs> thank you very much thank you yeah, good luck <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much peter and so much kevin for some really great insights and observations and helping our young people we really appreciate and value your input this afternoon and we know it will go a long way to really inspiring them to uh, to achieve some greatness as they reignite the uh, entrepreneurial in engine in rwanda um christelle yeah. i'm going to leave it to you now because i know that you would like to say some thanks to our two global experts and then i know you'd like to introduce um the minister so christelle it's over to you again uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. We, we, me and the whole group we would like to say thank you uh, to you, uh, Dr. Bonfield and Professor Kevin. This has been a really amazing session and we got some great insights about marketing, about branding, and uh, the we like personally, I realized that there are a lot of things I've been doing wrong and that now I'm going to correct. And that is a life-changing journey for my business. Uh, so it, it was really surprising at first to hear that a person like you, uh, Professor, Kel Professor Kevin, that you're going to attend the 
uh, our session. We are really grateful that you have been with us and for all your insights. So most of us, is, most of us in this group share the sad story of failing in business because of poor branding. So having a seasoned expert in this very thing is of utmost importance for us. So for your time and dedication to us, we would really like to thank you. And uh, we would like to also thank the University of Westminster, Dr. Bofield. Thank you very much for this clinic. It's, uh, it's really changing our lives, really changing our businesses and the, and the way we are grateful that we have Daryl and Deborah. Hello? Christelle, we seem to have lost you. Are you there? It was a wonderful speech. I'm sure that Kevin and Peter would, would really appreciated that. That was really beautiful. I hope you can still hear us, Christelle. Peter? Yeah. Thank you very much, Christelle, and thank you very much, and very good luck, everybody. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Christelle, are you still there? Can you hear us? Christelle? Christelle? <laughs> oh, it's always the way. <laughs> okay. Your Excellency, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon, Paula. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. And um, it's our pleasure to welcome you. We've been talking a lot about, over the last few weeks, about building a more sustainable brand. Christelle, are you now there? Uh, hello. Christelle, I know you'd I like to say some things to the minister. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, uh, it, was I cut? I'm so sorry. It's okay. We're, we're, we'd like you to say um, thanks for, to the Minister for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, is, is she the, uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Minister. We are so grateful to have you and we are so excited. I'm really looking forward for, to this session. We have been really waiting for it and very excited. You're like a hero to us, to the young entrepreneurs. You are an inspiration, mostly for us women. You, you, you are our hero, someone we look up to, and we are really grateful to have you here. So we, are, uh, we really want to hear from you and what you have to tell us today. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks, uh, Christoph, uh, for those kind words and uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I would have loved to have joined you earlier uh, at the beginning to even just listen to those amazing solutions that each and every one of you has uh, tirelessly built over the last, uh, you know, weeks. Uh, I did catch a glimpse on some of the solutions that were shared um, when I got onto the call. And, and, and I'm very proud of, of, of the work that you've all been doing. Um, and I think um, have the kind of topics that you've been uh, discussing over the last, uh, uh, you know, one hour and a half or so, I think it's something that um, will never run out in terms of how much do you need to talk about professional development? How much do you need to always rethink uh, about your brand, whether it's, um, communicating you know uh, the purpose of your company or what you're really trying to achieve um, and uh, I'm sure you've had enough on those two topics uh, uh, I'm personally very passionate uh, when I'm talking about to uh, to uh, entrepreneurs I'm passionate about talking to them about uh, professional development for me it's a lifelong journey and it's something that just doesn't only apply to entrepreneurs it's everyone even myself uh, in the current capacity role that I that I'm having, you have to constantly be learning one or two things that allows you to be ahead um, in the market, but also at the same time that allows you to stay uh, relevant in the market. Um, COVID-19 has been a great example on how a single pandemic can disrupt every business across the world. And so no one is immune. Um, and, I, and, I, and I believe um, that's why, you know, professional development and always seeking for ways um, to stay relevant is, is really a, a lifelong, um, you know, intervention that you have to undertake. Um, uh, when I was asked to speak, uh, with us to talk about, you know, how entrepreneurs uh, would reignite the entrepreneurial 
um, you know, engine of Rwanda as part of the recovery plan. Um, and back in the day, one of the things, one of the classes that I took was around how do you promote entrepreneurship uh, in tandem with innovation capabilities? And I think those two things go hand in hand. Uh, those businesses, those um, entrepreneurial um, ideas that really withstand the test of time in many ways are also balancing, um, you know, the innovative um, the innovativeness of the solutions that products and services that they're bringing uh, to the market. So it's not one thing or the other. It's, it's rather being able to, you know, push both strands and uh, governments in many ways are really a uh, place to really not just um, have programs that are heavily skewed towards entrepreneurship, but also not promoting uh, innovation. Because what you end up happening really is um, uh, copy and paste ideas, business models from other markets, which may not necessarily be a good fit for the challenges you're looking to respond to. So when you're balancing the amount of investment and effort you're putting into having a creative and innovative product, uh, then um, you, 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 it guarantees the sustainability um, uh, of, of the kind of product or service that you're bringing to the market. Um, I think one of the other things uh, I'd wanted to talk about and which I believe has already been touched on, I think when I joined the call, someone was talking about it, is really the ability, the appetite for risk. Um, and I think just like all the entrepreneurs that are on this call, uh, I think that's one common denominator for all of you guys on the call, uh, that you see a challenge, um, you're, not, uh, you know, you're not scared by the risks that come with really thinking about the solutions you're going to provide that went into responding to that challenge. And I think that risk-taking um, you know, attitude or appetite that you have as an entrepreneur is really what takes you to the next level or that is able to grow your business um, uh, more broadly. Um, I was reading a book very recently, and it's something I would recommend for the entrepreneurs on the call today. If you haven't already read it, it's called The Prosperity Paradox. It talks about how innovation can lift nations out of poverty. So the very first time I, I buy this book, I'm thinking, uh, part of uh, the mandate of uh, the Minister of ICT and Innovation is to think about how innovation is actually going to take Rwanda to the next level of becoming a middle in a higher middle income country. Um, and for me, reading the title, I was very convinced I was going to get pretty much many of my answers. Uh, but by the time I finished reading it, I, I thought, A, I think every entrepreneur should be reading this book. It's not something that's just uh, uh, left to policymakers like myself to think about. But two, it really changed my look, my outlook on, uh, on, on promoting innovation, uh, removing my cup of uh, being a policymaker and really thinking about how am I creating policies and regulations that are going to uh, inspire uh, market-creating innovations. And I'll explain a bit for those that haven't read it, but please do look for it if you haven't. So market-creating innovations is really focused on saying, how do I understand the non-consumers in my market of a certain product? How do I understand the reasons why they are non-consumers? And if I design a product that is competing with already existing products in the market, how is this going to actually you know, transform them into customers and into consumers? And for me, that was such a deep, um, you know, eye-opening um, you know, experience for myself because when you holistically promote innovations, you're you know, thinking about how do I make sure, let's say, banking services are going, getting to everyone. We're talking about Made in Rwanda um, in many ways where we've had, for, I think Crystal mentioned she's from the fashion industry. I think the, one of the biggest challenges that has been voiced is how expensive um, you know, Made in Rwanda clothes can be. So Crystal coming into that space and saying, how do I get even the lowest uh, earning um, household in Rwanda to embrace and love and, and be a promoter and a consumer of made in Rwanda uh, clothing, what does that mean? What do I need to do differently without necessarily degrading the quality of the product you bring in the market, but really thinking what is it that will make them, uh, you know, actual consumers in, in this market. So it allows you one to get into a space that not so many people are competing into, but it gives you an edge. Um, and so you're not just coming in and creating another product and, and focused on, let's say, 20% of the market. You're competing with other, you know, five, four brands. But rather you're now going to these other 80% that probably no one has been looking at. They may not be bringing the most of the money, but they are definitely the bulk of the population. And so that aggregated is already gives you a sustainable business model. Um, and so really that book talks about how, you know, 
um, innovative entrepreneurs can really create new markets that didn't exist. And so even for you entrepreneurs that are going through Shivuka program, just thinking, just always, as you think of a business idea, always thinking about who are those non-consumers. Uh, something as simple as, you know, if it's water that is going to be sold, how many people cannot afford, let's say, bottled drinking water? What could be the alternative that still affords them drinking clean drinking water? But at the same time, um, in a in a much affordable way for uh, for this population, um, it also some of the key takeaways were around the gov the support that governments do play. But I think just like any other country, uh, any other economy around the world, um, as governments are always constrained on, on on these resources. So how do we get innovators like yourselves to come in and bridge that gap uh, that uh, already exists with the limited resources that we have? And so. Um, again, uh, I, I can't say it enough, but it would re it's, a, it's a highly recommended read for anyone who hasn't done that because I feel it really changes our um, one's view around entrepreneurship and even mostly for people in policy making roles to think differently about how we are promoting innovations that, um, that create new markets because that's what you're really looking for. Um, I wanted to just touch very lightly on branding because I'm sure you've had a good hour of talking about branding. Uh, but um, I do believe it can make or break your, you know, your, your product or service offerings. Um, and sometimes, especially for people who are coming from a tech world, you're only thinking about, let me give you a very good product, but you don't think about the effort that goes into branding it and making it look really stand out. And you may have so many products that are similar in nature on the market, but how does yours stand out? And I think branding gives you that edge uh, in doing that. So again, I know I had just five minutes. <laughs> uh, I do want to repeat many of the things that I believe, um, you know, uh, both Professor um, Kevin and uh, Dr. Peter talked about. I believe there was more to that. Uh, but I also just wanted to use this opportunity um, to let you know that as a government of Rwanda, we're very committed to promoting and developing entrepreneurs and more particularly as someone who has the innovation docket uh, in, the, in the government, we are also uh, committed to um, uh, promoting innovative um, uh, you know, entrepreneurship business models or innovative entrepreneurs. So um, we have very many programs that we're looking at. In fact, one of the things um, we, we've challenged ourselves on as a sector is to say, our innovation mandate is not only strictly to um, tech businesses, but we should be thinking about how we inspire innovation in even non-tech, non traditional industries that may, do not necessarily have to uh, have a tech aspect to it. And so, that those are some of the you know areas that we're already looking at to say let's promote innovation more holistically. Uh, of course, there will be a very special focus on how you leverage technology uh, to build more innovative and creative products and services. But then, with, in the absence of you know, the ability to use that, how else are we innovating in a traditional manner? So as I end, I just wanted to end off with a vote of thanks uh, to the entrepreneurs. Uh, Christelle, you said you might, I'm, your he I'm your hero, but I think you guys are the real heroes. The amount of risks you take, I cannot even start to think about them. So uh, thank you for really everything that you're doing in, in looking at challenges and, and seeing them as opportunities. And, and just going in, um, you know, full force to see how you can be part of um, Rwanda's development journey, but also even as we get out uh, of this pandemic. Uh, and actually, I just realized one of the things I want to talk about, I think for many of you have looked at the economic recovery plan, a big segment of it looks at the recovery uh, fund that is focused on supporting uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. All of you fit in that category. And uh, as a government, we're looking to say, how do we support you financially? Uh, how do we support you from a skills point of view, technically? How do we uh, you know, support you in opening markets uh, that will allow you to grow and scale, but at the same time, allow the economy to collectively recover from the effects of this pandemic? So back to my very last point again, um, you know, massive thank you to the University of Westminster uh, Deborah and Daryl, thank you for really uh, putting together such a great program. Um, I'm sure the entrepreneurs have a lot to say about the kind of value that you've created for them in, in designing such a program. Uh, Professor Kevin and Dr. Peter, thank you for spending your time today uh, to share those very useful insights that I know are going to help these entrepreneurs on their next journey.
So without much, uh, uh, I would like to, you know, just say thank you for having me this afternoon. I do hope I can always, you know, whenever I can, make some time to just sit in and listen uh, on some of the amazing things that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much as well. Um, it was great for you to be here and we'll be delighted to have you back anytime to sit in and listen to what we're doing. And we will, of course, keep you updated with the great work that our young entrepreneurs are taking forwards as part of the recovery plan for sure. And that's really what our focus is with them so that they can we pivot into the new economic landscape and um, we can help them along the way and contribute to that national strategy as well. Christelle, would you like to say some words? Uh, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. So, Honorable Minister, thank you very much. I don't know how we can express our gratitude. It was short, but very important and uh, very inspiring. I can't believe we saw you here today addressing to us personally. We are used to seeing you on the news, on TV, or in, on uh, some greatest YouTube channel. So thinking you're here with us is truly an honor. This program, Shivuka, has been doing wonders to our businesses, to our ways of thinking, and having you here is also one of them. So thank you very much. We express our deepest gratitude for, for you setting time aside to be with us uh, in this amazing session. It has been truly an honor to have you here, one of, uh, uh, I don't know, I, like you, you are my idol. Uh, <laughs> You, you are a brilliant mind and we admire your work and uh, we realize that the future is digital now and we appreciate all the efforts you are doing to pave the road for us to achieve that and uh, we are working so hard day and night to contribute to the development of this country to build a sustainable community and we assure you that we are going to work with you uh, to build a better tomorrow for this country country so thank you very much thanks christel i'll definitely come by and make sure i promote one of your fashions wow great yeah of course you have a very great sense of style which is not so common in a political woman here <laughs> you can check out my page it's niche on instagram i have some amazing products you can be interested in great thank you and I mean, just want to say thank you as well for being here. We are joined by many members from the Chamber of Young Entrepreneurs that are part of this Kwama Ganga, um, including um, um, Bonfil um, and Wilson. Bonfil is running a great educational toy company. Wilson's really looking at re reigniting domestic tourism. Um, and we're joined by Pasafik, the director of the Chamber of Young Entrepreneurs, with whom we've signed an MOU today so that between Shibuka and the Chamber, we can begin to really start to develop this relationship a lot further and deepen it and support more, more young entrepreneurs um, in the future beyond this original initial pilot program. So thank you very much. Thanks, Daryl. Could you thank share you with us just a, a list of these solutions that they have and just so we can have a look and get some other people looking into them that can support them to scale? Absolutely, we'd be delighted to. You know, we have Pacific here, who's a wonderful young architect, and Bonfil, and Christelle, and Wilson, and um, and, and Jean Claude, and others. So, and David, who's running a successful young enterprise as well. So, we will share with you what they're doing, um, for sure, and how how the government may be able to support them going forwards with us. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah. Can I leave the last word to you? Um, thank you for um, um, everyone's um, contribution today. Um, clearly, um, I've been listening to every single word and I've been hanging on every single word that everyone's shared. And what's important to me about this is that um, we are not just talkers, we're actually all doers. So from um, our the contributions from Dr. Peter Bonfield, um, from Professor Kevin Keller, um, they gave us some very clear, practical, bite-sized steps 
and I know that there, there are you, you, you guys are all going to implement them. Um, that's really what I want to emphasise. And then the amazing words for from 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 Her Excellency. Um, she's definitely you can see. Yeah, we can see she's looking good. I've got to mm. say that as well. But anyway, that's 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 a female thing. But that aside. Um, we can see that the government are very clear about scaling up and that's what really made me smile um, about what Paula um, said. She used the word scalability. So we're not simply thinking about, yes, developing you as entrepreneurs. We're also now thinking about, okay, what are the next steps around scalability? So I would like you all to continue to um, do the steps that we've been asking you to do. Yeah, you know, that's the educator in me. I want you to go back and do all the steps that we've been asking you to do and keep on remembering that you have an, uh, uh, you're surrounded by expertise that want you to scale to benefit yourselves as well as, um, um, as, as well as Rwanda and your family. So thank you very much for, um, bringing your enthusiasm, your motivation, but also your ability to walk the talk. So thank you very much. And, and I also want to thank my colleague, uh, Daryl, for putting in so much effort in terms of coordination. Um, I work with him, clearly you know that, and he's tireless um, with his ability to coordinate. I also want to thank Pasafik for ensuring that um, all the members from the um, um, chamber are here and there are other journalists also here. Um, I also want to thank you because we are, we do need to continue to share these good stories and the thing that I loved that Kevin said, it's how we make people feel and we want people to feel good about Rwanda but also to feel good that despite the pandemic we are still taking a way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we will be in touch and we thank everyone for participating today and collaborating and co-creating. It's been a wonderful time getting to this point. Uh, thank you to my colleague, Deborah, who equally works tirelessly behind the scenes with me. Um, and also Natida, who I know has now left us, but is actually also you know, very much part of the team so um, great to have everybody here today. Thank you for this amazing session. We've had a wonderful afternoon and we look forward to seeing you again very shortly. Take care, everyone. Marcosi, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, have a good day.